thanks for coming to talk with us tonight. Well, well thank you for having me. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's already been great talking to you so far. Uh, so, um, for people who aren't familiar with your work, do you mind if you do just kind of like. give an overview of, of what you're working on now? Yeah. What I'm doing now? Yeah. Oh, oh, right now. Right now. Oh, I'm 89. That's the number <laughs> one. Okay. Uh, that holds you back in certain ways. Uh, you don't think as fast at 89 as you do at 50. I don't think. At least I find that. I get stuck factoring, okay, for example. So that's one of the tragedies. But you, I don't think you think a lot stupider. You, you have certain things better. You know, your general ideas are better. So it, it's worth getting old. Don't, don't die young if you can avoid it. Uh, so what am I doing right now? Well, we have this thing which you got me to give you a talk about, which is this gravitational wave stuff. And we're, okay, I'll tell you exactly what we're doing. When we built LIGO, which is that instrument called the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, uh, nobody quite knew of what scale to make it. And the reason was we didn't really have the sensitivity. We sort of worked at making the sensitivity. And we didn't really have a good idea what the source strength was. And that wasn't just because we didn't know how to calculate what a black hole, if it d did exist, how a black hole would radiate. Because that was known well enough, even though the theory was very complicated. You didn't, to powers of, to, to factors of two or three, you knew it, okay? That wasn't the problem. The real problem was how many of those suckers actually are out there? And there was a very strong movement within the uh, MIT physics department. I'm thinking the epic I'm talking about is sort of the 1980s when this was all being formulated, uh, who said there are no black holes. Black holes is a fiction of some crazy people. And Einstein didn't disagree with them. I mean, you know, having an infinity in an equation didn't look good. But the infinity in the equation turned out to be a coordinate problem, not a fundamental problem. That sort of never really got appreciated. Uh, and anyway, so the real problem was uh, we didn't know the number of sources we would detect. And we did what we could. We made the instrument four kilometers long. The LIGO instrument is an interferometer which has uh, L shape like this. And uh, it's a Michelson interferometer uh, with some fancy stuff inside of it to make it more sensitive. We can talk about that more later. But you had to get to a sensitivity everybody realized that was at a level where you were measuring a strain, which is what a gravitational wave does. It makes a strain in space and time. But you can write it in such a way that it's only in space. I'll get to describing the wave later. But the thing is that but the, the, the amount of strain Theorists had calculated, in particular, one of the more important theorists was Chip Thorne, who was at Caltech, and had to dedicated a whole part of his theoretical group to trying to make sure that black hole physics was understood. He'd been trained uh, earlier of at, uh, at Princeton. Uh, and, uh, well, that was the sort of, he, not with Einstein, but with Wheeler, John Wheeler, who was sort of the person who coined the word black hole and took on all the strange stuff that came out of general relativity and tried to make sense of it geometrically. Uh, that was, and, we, and, and Wheeler and, and Kip got along very well, and Wheeler then influenced Kip. Kip went back to Caltech, started a group, and the first thing that he actually did, Kip, was to try to calculate what sources are out there and how big might the strain be that we could detect on the Earth from them. And the number that he came up with wasn't too bad, as you'll see. It was around 10 to minus 21, a strain. Now, what is a strain? It's a change in length. Here are the two points, and let's say the distance between them is L, and then you say, let's say they move a little bit. That little tiny motion is delta L, and L is the big thing. So delta L divided by L is the strain. It's the same way a mechanical engineer would measure the stretch of a steel bar. You know, the steel bar is so long, you load it, and it gets shrunk a little bit because it's loaded. That, that's the way you measure strain in, uh, in, in, in a real mechanical system. It turns out, and this is something we'll learn later if you care to, that space is a hell of a lot stiffer than steel. That's one of the things that most people don't understand. You can't, you can't do anything to space, hardly at all. And that's why when you, even with a strain of 10 to the minus 21 uh, coming at the Earth, the energy that's associated with that is unbelievable the amount of energy so, so associated with that wave, the amount of work that had to be done to strain space is gigantic. 
uh, a number that's sort of interesting to use is, uh, yeah, you take steel, this is the Young's modulus of steel, okay? And that's some number, okay? I, I, mean, I don't remember, it's 10 to the 12 in units I love, which is units you guys don't use anymore. That's CGS what, units? Uh, or CGS units. Yep, I, my my I can't undergrad get advisor loves CGS units. CGS units. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah, you have to learn some other stuff, but. So it, they were God's it, units. <laughs> God, CGS is just wonderful. And uh, anyway, so it's, uh, yeah, it's about 10 to the 12 dynes per centimeter squared. And uh, the s if you take the stiffness of space and s calculate that, you'll find out it's about 10 to the 20 times larger than that. 10 to the 20, 20, 10 to the 20 larger than steel at about 100 hertz. It's frequency dependent. It depends on the frequency. The higher the frequency, the higher the, the, the force is needed to, to stress it. So it's, it, and, and then uh, the reason I make a big fuss about this is that, and I'll show you when we talk later on, if we do want to talk about an observed source, I'll translate that into a uh, strain that you might feel in your body, and it's really <laughs> just zilch. I mean, uh, uh, but anyway, the, uh, 10 to minus 21 was the number that ultimately was used. It turned out to be about right. The very first thing we detected was around a strain of 10 to minus 21. But what was that a product of? That was a product of, in the Einstein theory, you have to, what makes the strain? Well, the masses of the black holes. So these were 30 solar mass black holes. And they were spinning at each other at, uh, well, at the end they were going about 100 hertz, maybe 200 hertz, sort of. C below middle C on the piano, okay? And uh, those are very important numbers in the power calculation. And the other one is how far away it was. And that first black hole we saw was about a billion light years away. One billion, 10 to the nine. So uh, yeah, anyway, and the strain we saw was 10 to the minus 21. Okay, so, uh, so, the, 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 so going back to the early history of this, the problem was with trying to tell people that it was worth working on was that we didn't know the sources, we didn't know how many there would be, and most of them didn't believe you could measure something as small as that. So let me translate that 10 to minus 21 into something else. We, we later on built a four, LIGO is four kilometer, has four kilometer arms. And those four kilometer arms are the, the, the L in the denominator. So if you wanna know what delta L you're talking about, you're talking about a few times 10 to minus 18 meters. Okay, I hope I did that right. So yeah, a few times 10 to minus 18 meters for four kilometers. Yeah, 10 to three, yeah. And so uh, you're talking about something 1,000th the size of a nucleus, which you guys know better than I. So you know, and yet you're doing things with light. How the hell do you do that? That's gonna be one of, I know one of your questions. And, and so, but people even those days didn't believe you could do that. That was really the big problem. And that dean who was a pain in the ass to me and later became provost was the bigger pain in the ass. <laughs> even when he became that, uh, didn't believe a word of it. And he had some faculty to support him, okay? Mm. So that was the beginning of it. And now you ask me, what am I working on now? Well, I'm working on a, well, now that we've seen something, which is the, you know, we see, we've seen black holes, lots of them, up to about 90 pair binaries. Uh, we're trying to improve the apparatus right now. We're not running right now. Um, but uh, the, uh, when we, and they've seen two neutron stars, uh, one neutron star beautifully, uh, neut two neutron stars going around each other. That was probably one of the most interesting events that happened in astronomy in about 2017. We can talk about that if you get interested in it. And uh, that uh, gave us all sorts of results. And the reason why is it was seen not only by LIGO, it was seen also by Virgo, which is another gravitational wave detector. That one happens to be in Europe. And they have plans for the future too, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, and uh, then, uh, yeah, it was, once it was identified with Virgo and LIGO together, we had many, many differences in time. Uh, let me just say that this L that, I, that is the detector has no sensitivity in position. It's most sensitive for gravitational waves coming down on the plane of the L, coming down but it's also sensitive at all angles. There's one angle where they don't like respond at all at 45 degrees, a cone of 45 degrees. And that was critical in the, the Virgo. Virgo didn't see it. They didn't see the neutron star binary, we did. And so we, they should have had the sensitivity to see it. And so we guessed it must have been in that zone of silence of that 45 degrees. And that was a good guess because when we put that in, 
to the solution of where is that source. And you do it only by timing, the same way you do nuclear physics experiments. Right. You know, you can't point nuclear physics experiments. You yeah, measure you time, time, time yeah. and distance and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, this is not a telescope that you, you can aim. Okay? Um, so what happens is that uh, you need m the more differences in time you have, the better you can determine where the source is on the sky. You need more s detectors also. It's something I haven't told you, that gravitational waves come in two polarizations. I'll get to that later. They, they, you have to separate the polarization. That means how does a stretch take place? Maybe I should say it now. I mean, the, there are two modes of the two polarizations. Just like in electric field, you have linear polarization this way and that way, okay? That, or, and circular polarization that way and this way. In gravity waves, because there's a spin two field, I, if you ever, it's quadrupole right. radiation in the end. Uh, what comes of it is that the, you, the, the polarization is, and this is now telling you what the gravitational wave looks like. Maybe I should show it to you. Yeah.